As we all adapt to a COVID-19 world, BMI Tampa would like to thank our chapter sponsors for their ongoing support of manager education. Okay, Steve and Caroline, the floor is yours. I want to thank you guys for presenting today. Thank you and good afternoon to everybody. Carolyn and I are actually, although we appear side by side on the screen, we're side by side in offices too. So it's a little bit difficult to do this uh, in this format, but we'll have fun doing it, what the heck. Today's presentation is the top 10 managers do's and don'ts. And it's a canned seminar from Becker. So you're going to hear our comments on some of the things that may or may not align with what you see on the screen. That's kind of the fun part of it. Uh, as to credits, I think Harry has all of your CAM information. And if you've logged in, we know that uh, you're here. You can post questions. Um, if you've got them, we will be watching for those as well. I'll go down through the um, slideshow as you see it, and then I have several others to add to it just in case. So here we go. We start off with limited proxies. Obviously in condo or in HOA world, you get limited proxies. Do go ahead and open them, tally them as they come in. Uh, so you have a tally. You know when the uh, meeting opens up what we're dealing with. I've been to meetings where the matter voted by limited proxies already passed. It goes a lot smoother if you're honest with the folks, and you should be, and tell them, hey, it's already passed. We have enough in hand to pass it. Or on the other hand, if it's dead on arrival, you might as well tell them that. Uh, save the time and the emotions but also it gives you a chance to verify things like signatures on those limited proxies, dates, that they've checked the correct boxes, uh, they've actually voted it. If it has not yet been voted, please do not attempt to alter it. It is a legal document. So if the owner did not check the box you know, for or against the proposition, you cannot do it for them. It is not then a general proxy, it is a limited proxy abstaining. So make sure that uh, you do not alter it in any way. Proxies are revocable, meaning that they can take them back at any time up until the time it's cast. But if you go ahead and uh, check it in, somebody then shows up for the meeting, even if it's on Zoom, and they say, hey, I'd like to change it, they can, right up until the time it's cast. Don't wait until the membership meeting is called to order to open the proxies. 
you may find out that it wasn't signed at all. You may find out that they've already voted. You may find out that it was not signed by the proper person. Let's deal with those issues in the comfort and convenience of your office, not in the throes of the meeting where the people are waiting for you, even in the Zoom environment where they're all waiting for you to move forward. If you've had the time to address the issues, uh, you'll find yourself a much happier person at that meeting. Moving to violations. When you see violations, cite them, be uniform and fair. That's one of the reasons communities have a CAM. They have the CAM because it's not easy for board members, they just don't do it well, uh, condemning their neighbors going, you know, you've got a dirty mailbox or you shouldn't have that out on your balcony. Uh, the CAM can call balls and strikes and say, the mailbox really is not that dirty. It's consistent with the other ones in the community given the uh, location of the mailbox and the age of the community. They're all about the same. And just because the president put in a brand new one, he or she can't tell the CAM, hey, make sure everybody else's looks like mine. That's why we hire CAMs. It's your judgment that is uh, one of the most valuable assets of being a CAM for a community. Send the violation in a letter form, and if the violation is attributable to a tenant or occupant, the letter should be addressed to the owner, copy to the tenant or occupant. In this regard, some CAMs are reluctant or some boards are reluctant to cite other people. The rules apply to everybody. So if I've got the pizza delivery person and he or she is not parking where they should be, you know, they pull up and block in three other people because they're just there to drop off the pizza and that's a violation or they speed through the community, you can cite the pizza delivery person and you can go back to their local person, the, let's assume it's Domino's, and we can go to the closest Domino branch and go, hey, your driver violated our rules and we're going to cite the driver or we're going to give them a caution or a warning, make sure that they abide by our rules when they come through the condo. We've actually had uh, local pizza folks turn around and appreciate that kind of stuff and send us free pizzas for the annual meeting. So there's you know a silver lining there somewhere, particularly if you're hungry. Um, don't Steve, just talk, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, you may want to put your PowerPoint up because right now you're, you're not on screen share. You should see PowerPoint. Thank you for letting me know, because that should be second slide. And I've got it on both and screen share. You're on screen share. Let me make sure you're, you're allowed to do screen share. Well, it was. I wonder, I, wonder if it, I wonder if it removed you as screen share when I did my video. Let's just hang on a second. Ah, that could be. So you're, so, it's telling you you are on screen share. Not anymore. It was. This attachment also, you guys, when I sent the email out with the uh, link to this webinar, there was an Good. attachment of the outline of what he's going to be discussing today as well. And you'll work on that and I'll keep going a little bit. I'll watch for the sign because it's no longer there. I don't have the full display. Okay, uh, who can start screen sharing? All panelists, okay, try now. Should be there, that's the, the only mode I am in. Inside of display settings. No, nope, that's the only thing I'm getting is limited proxies and went to violations. Well, well, all right, well, we'll go by the, um, the, the thing, the point that you sent us earlier. Okay, we'll see where we go with that. I'll keep going because of the content, but perhaps a little slower because you're not seeing it on your screens yet. I have faith. On the violations, we were saying do not address them by uh, speaking with the violator in the hallway, the pool, sending something by email. First of all, we go by the uh, rule of Miranda, 
which is anything you say can and will be used against you, but it'll also be uh, misquoted. So that if you go up to somebody and go, I don't really think your mailbox is that dirty, but we've gotten complaints. The only thing they'll hear is the manager said they didn't think that the mailbox was dirty. Or if you say something, we got complaints about your mailbox, they still will say, manager told us we've never had complaints about your mailbox. They will hear what they want to hear. You will be misquoted. It is one of the dangers of verbal communications. So put it in writing, document it. I like uh, many of the management companies are able to include a picture with the violation. You know, what part of my lawn is bad? Show me the dirt on the mailbox or whatever the violation is. If it can be captured in the form of a uh, photograph and you can do that, that's great. Or keep one for your file showing that on the date that you issued the violation letter, it was in fact in violation because it may get cured before they actually receive the letter, particularly with uh, postal slowdowns and things like that. Don't post notices on their door or under the door. They will claim that someone else got it or they never saw it. Same with the emails. Go back to the old fashioned letters. If you have a situation where you have a concierge and he or she can hand deliver it to the person, terrific. Uh, if you can have a guard or somebody give it to them, that's fine as well. But otherwise, US mail, um, certified as we get more aggressive with things and depending on the severity of the particular violation and i'm still not seeing screen share i'll just keep going go to the next slide which is dealing with uh, amendments and the general rule is have the attorney draft and prepare all amendments now I'm not one to try to kick up work and say, you know, you need an attorney for this because you can't do that. You've never seen an amendment before. Um, even simple amendments. And the simplest one I could think of would be inserting a comma. You know, you look at a particular provision in a declaration and it says, declaration can be amended by a vote of three quarters of the owners at a meeting. Those of us who are old enough to remember grammar school, when we diagram sentences, we would say at a meeting is a prepositional phrase and you should have a comma before every prepositional phrase. Therefore, three quarters of the members comma at a meeting. Well, I've now changed the legal import of that particular amendment and it now says three quarters of all owners, not three quarters of those who showed up at the meeting. So even the simple insertion of a comma is a problem legally, although grammatically I've now created perfection and made all the English teachers happy. The lawyers aren't so happy, but more important, the owners aren't going to be happy when they realize that the insertion of that single comma has condemned them to a much higher standard that they may never be able to meet. So be careful with that. And the same thing happens when you borrow amendments. You say, well, Steve did this amendment for us at the you know, one property and we're going to borrow that amendment and move it elsewhere. It may not be the same uh, in context of another community. I saw one, it's actually being gated. I have a hearing this afternoon with this community. Uh, they took an amendment and it has a quorum issue in it and they changed the quorum. Well, let's change the quorum. Well, they forgot that there is a quorum reference in the Articles of Incorporation. So now they have a different quorum in the articles and a different quorum in the bylaws. And it, well, look at all the money they saved. They drafted the amendment by themselves, they put it in, and now they're spending thousands of dollars in court litigating over which one prevails and did something happen at a prior meeting whether they had a quorum or not for it, and it goes on and on and on. There's also the other issue of amendments. If in fact a non-lawyer does it, the Florida Supreme Court has said that may be UPL, unauthorized practice of law. Uh, the attorneys, we don't do amendments perfectly. I get that, I've seen 
some of my own handiwork in the past. Go, God, did I really write that 10 years ago? Yes, you did. Uh, things change. We are constantly improving. And so if we have amendments that were drafted even four or five years ago, we would look at those and perhaps update them. Another one that came across my desk yesterday was uh, a pet amendment done by another law firm, good law firm here in the Tampa Bay area, not a member of BMI. And they had dogs and cats. And it was, you may have either three dogs or three cats or a combination thereof. Well, what does that mean? Combination of three and three, combinations of dogs and cats. You know, by the way, what about fish and birds and things like that? So not well thought out, even you know, poorly drafted and would be problematic for any kind of an enforcement regime. So we'd have to be very, very careful with uh, the drafting and the experience of the attorney, if he or she has litigated that particular clause or has reviewed something similar, will certainly benefit and have great value for the association. And it helps keep you off the line of fire if things go south on that particular amendment. Okay, reasonable accommodation requests is the next one. This is a Fair Housing or Americans with Disabilities Act uh, issue, depending on your community. The most common application for us will be fair housing, but there are instances where the ADA will apply. If you get a request for an accommodation from a handicapped resident or a guest, hand that one over to the attorney for review. Uh, the potential consequences are severe. Uh, we all know whether you're in Pinellas or Hillsborough or any other county, they all have a community relations, human relations department that will take the side of the owner, do a full press investigation, and try to find the association in violation. I can't put it any other way. That's their ultimate goal, is to try to find the violation. And when they can do that, um, you may or may not have insurance to defend you for a discrimination claim. And they will name everyone in sight, and it just gets ugly and expensive. But if it can be handled correctly from the beginning, one, you may end up doing the right thing. And whether it's approving or denying the request, it'll be handled correctly. Uh, I rarely, rarely see law firms messing up on this. So I'm very comfortable saying, send it to your association attorney. He or she will handle it in an emotionally removed way so that it's not somebody who is perhaps emotionally interested in the particular application or the applicant, and you get uh, legal compliance at a uh, much lower cost than the consequences. Uh, um, we saw for several years, own, own submitting the buy online uh, forms, you know, from the doctor in who knows where, who's never really met that person. You spend, the lowest I found was $29. You can get a fake ID card and a fake vest. And you know, for a few extra dollars, they'll throw in the letter. And many people have uh, given way to that. You know, they see the official registry. There is no such official registry. There is no certification from the federal government. When we start seeing the fake letters, we become suspicious and we're allowed to engage in constructive dialogue with the owner. Um, if you had asked me back prior to December of 2019, I probably would have said, yeah, you see the fake letters, it's really, that's almost presumptive that they are you know, faking the application. December, I had somebody that had submitted a fake one in November, early December, another fake one. So they've now spent more than $100. And when we were just saying, you know, two strikes, you're going to be out unless you can do something here. They came in with a real letter and said the person actually did have a disability and did qualify for the accommodation. Why they wasted their time and effort on the first two, I'll never know. But it taught me a lesson 
that we can be skeptical, but there may be more to it. And we shouldn't reach conclusions saying that every person who presents uh, a fake application for an accommodation is in fact a person who does not need that accommodation, that they are in fact submitting a false application. Obviously, Florida law as to emotional support animals changed July 1, and we require more documentation by Florida statute and have criminalized the fake application process uh, and should be aware of that as well. But again, because it is criminal, you don't want to be accusing somebody of a crime that becomes what we call slander per se or libel per se, depending on how you publish it. And, because, and it could create a very significant liability for you if you accuse somebody of a criminal act and they did not in fact commit that crime. So reasonable accommodation requests, send that over to the uh, attorney. I did moderate a uh, presentation for the American Bar Association uh, at the end of last month, it would be July, 2020 for those listening later. Um, we had two attorneys from the uh, Justice Department on our panel, and we asked them about the people who are frequent filers of these kinds of complaints, uh, somebody who may use, uh, let's say, Google Earth or a drone to oversee your property without ever really setting foot on your property and say, hey, they don't have ramps or they don't have the right accommodations for handicapped individuals on their property. Uh, the two attorneys from the Justice Department said they're really, really sick of seeing that and they fully discount those things and send them on their way, which is kind of good to know. And those of us who have properties that are kind of attractive for the frequent filer uh, that the just This one for fining, um, it says, have the association adopt a formal written policy for the issuance of fines in hearings before the fining committee? Um, I disagree. And well, mostly. If we're gonna have a fining policy, the number one rule should be, we're gonna follow the statute. And we've got to do that because it's the statute and the statute changed five years ago. Hopefully you're up to date with that. It's been five years. Um, the change five years ago was that the board levies the fine and then it goes to the committee. A lot of us did it the other way around before the statute changed and allowed the committee to do the heavy lifting, the due process, and then send it to the board for final action. This is one committee that can literally overrule the board. I don't like that concept, but it is the law, so we have to follow it. But also, all fines are not final until it goes, until it goes to that committee, so do make sure that you do have a fine committee. Um, if the particular violation is one that is going to take some time, I hate to say to somebody, uh, replace your roof and do it in 14 days. Well, that's never going to happen. If you say 30 days, maybe, but not likely, but I don't wanna wait 31 days to find out that they're ignoring us. So we would probably want to send them a violation letter saying, we need a proposal from a roofer signed by you within 30 days or something like that showing that they are in fact going to comply. But also, the finding policy should consider things like life safety issues. Am I going to tell somebody, this is your first warning, don't do it again. You're going to get a second warning and a third warning before anything bad happens, and you've been parking in front of the fire hydrant. And you park there every day and say, hey, 
they're going to send me a violation letter once a week for the next three weeks. I'll park in front of the fire hydrant for three weeks. No, that one I would like to start finding immediately. So my fine policy, if I'm going to have one, should be flexible and it should allow the board to have discretion based on the facts. Somebody has a gun in the common elements and is waving it around recklessly. We're going to send them a letter saying, don't do it again. We're going to give them a second and a third chance. Probably not. At least I would hope not. Somebody who leaves their trash can out because they just got home late from court or something important like whatever their life involves other than taking in the trash can, they forgot. Are you going to find them immediately? Probably not. You're going to give them a second chance? I hope so. Um, most judges don't want us going to court over a garbage can unless there's more to it. Also, in the finding policy, I like to be able to consider the person's history. Is this their first violation in 10 years? Or have they been a perpetual violator and they playing games until they get close to a fine? They've been correcting other violations. So their history is something we'd like to be able to consider. I would also like to consider their attitude, particularly their attitude towards the camp. If they call you up or come to your office or send you a nasty email and say whatever is nasty to you, that should be taken in consideration when we get to the finding. And so you can submit that to the board and say, yeah, this is what I got from Mrs. Smith and say, you know, when I was walking, doing my inspection of the property, Mrs. Smith assaulted me and called me bad things and screamed and shouted, that can be taken into consideration. Um, the don't part of the slide, in case you can't see it or if you don't have access to it, says do not issue fines or conduct hearings without formally adopted policies prepared by the association attorney. Yeah, we can and should help you with the procedures of that hearing. It takes about five minutes to tell that committee how to do one. Sometimes we'll do a live one with them to help them through the first one, and they pretty much catch on from there. Um, if you don't have a fine committee, can you do fines? Yes. The board levies the fine, and you can go back to the owner and say, yeah, the board on August 18th levied a fine of $500. Now, before it goes to the committee, we're gonna give you an opportunity to comply. Most cases they'll comply because we can predict where the committee is going to go. They're going to approve the fine, then it's out of the board's hands. So if we're looking for compliance, we offer them the one final opportunity. It's now $500. If we give it to the committee, it's going to be set in stone. It's gonna be due in five days by statute but here's your way out, it's called compliance. We could even dangle a little reduction there and go, and if you pay us $100 or we'll suspend it if you comply, because that's really the objective here. Moving to board policies. Board policies, the do is, do have the association establish written policies concerning access to official records, that's one. Response to written inquiries, that's two, and that's by statute. And three, unit owner participation at meetings. That's number three, sorry. Uh, so you've got access to official records, response to written inquiries, and unit owner participation at meetings have board policies for those three. The absence of those things will subject you to abuse. So if you don't have a policy on access to official records, some owner is probably going to find that it's entertaining for them to send you all kinds of requests. And if you don't have a limitation on the number of documents, the number of people to attend, how the application for access to the official records must occur, you're gonna find yourselves abused. The same thing for responses to written inquiries. People will find the smallest possible font and fill the largest possible page and send you written inquiries just because they can. And they're all homebound now and they've got nothing better to do than to do that kind of thing. The same with unit owner participation in meetings. Can I assign my time to Carolyn and say, I don't feel like speaking. You can have my three minutes. And then she aggregates it 
to the point where she can stop talk for 30 minutes on nothing and you really can't stop her. So we want to be careful with that. Do not attempt to enforce restrictions regarding access to official records, response to unit owner written inquiries, unit owner participation at meetings without formal written policies prepared by the attorney approved by the board. That's the do not part of it. There are lots of arbitration decisions on these issues and the attorney will help you craft policies that are going to pass muster when somebody submits an arbitration request. It goes to arbitration, the arbitrator uh, is looking at it and they say, well, we created it with the assistance of our attorney and he or she provided us with arbitration decisions or general policies from arbitrations that supported that particular policy, whether it's participation at the meeting, unit owner resp responses to the written inquiries or the access to official records. Candidly, it's the access to the official records that gets uh, cited most often because of the financial penalties. I've got a lady here in Hillsborough County who is demanding that we provide, we, the association, provide her certain records. Well, that's not what the statute provides. So she's not going anywhere, but she's sure making a pest of herself because it gives her personal gratification to do that. And in the end, she's gonna find out she's wrong. It's just a little bit of time before we get there. Contracts, have the attorney review contracts for non-business legal terms. Um, when you're looking at a contract, of course the manager, you're, you can and do negotiate contracts and you should, um, you do that for a living, perfectly fine. But when you get to terms like venue, what does that mean? Force majeure, uh, remedies, what remedies do you want for a particular contract? The rollover provisions, um, compliance with 718.3025, that's my favorite by the way. Uh, it is a statute in the Condominium Act that tells you what terms are needed for an enforceable contract. Uh, in the indemnification clause, I saw one yesterday, um, it was an elevator contract. The elevator expert did a great job getting all the technical terms, not so hot on the uh, legal terms. The indemnification provision forgot to indemnify the manager. That's kind of important to most of us uh, today that the manager be indemnified in case there is a claim over the elevator. Somebody gets uh, entrapped or delayed in their use of the elevator or injured. I want the elevator company indemnifying people, particularly the manager, happy to do that. But these other provisions, the venue, force majeure, the remedies, those are things that uh, we as the attorneys look for, among other things. Um, under that force majeure clause that's come up a lot lately with the COVID-19 pandemic, people are looking at the force majeure provisions and contracts to see if it excuses performance. That's typically what it says, it excuses performance, but it's gotta be mutual. We want to make sure that if their performance is excused, our obligation to pay is also excused. And we'll use hypothetically a cable television contract. Okay, force majeure happens. There's no cable television. I want to make sure we don't have to pay them for the non-provision of cable television. The contracts, we have to tell the boards that the manager is not going to look for those non-business legal terms. Also, do not sign a contract without having it looked at by the attorney. Um, it doesn't cost a lot to have the attorney do it. Contracts are not meant to be broken and not every contract can be gotten out of very easily or inexpensively. There usually is a cost and it's far more expensive to get out of some contracts than it is to have the attorney just review it and approve it and say, oh, you understand that this contract is for, you know, three or five years. Um, 
we like to put in there that the vendor has to notify us when the contract is up and that it not automatically roll over without notifying us. You know, if you sign that five-year contract, typically we will have a different board of directors and they may not know that their contract is expiring this year. And there may be a short window of time before it rolls over into another period of time and becomes an even longer contract. Letters of intent. Do submit any letter of intent to the association attorney for review. Why? I've gotten too many instances where somebody says, well, we signed and accepted their proposal, but we don't have a contract yet. Yeah, you do. If you sign that proposal, the letter of intent, it is our intent to provide you with, you name the service, and we agree to pay you the price. I now have a binding contract. Shame on you, us, them, whoever did it, for signing that letter of intent, creating a binding contract with no other terms. There's no warranty, no guarantee, time for a start, time to complete, insurance provisions, what they're going to do on the property, compliance with our rules regarding parking or whatever it is, but you've got a signed contract with that letter of intent and it can and will be used against you. Don't do it. Don't sign anything. And particularly, don't sign it as your name as Cam and say, you know, I, John Jones, sign the contract. Now I've got a contract, was a letter of intent. Now it's a contract between John Jones and the provider. Let's try not to do that. It's just not good for your credit. Do not allow the association to execute any letter of intent without being reviewed by the association attorney is the don't side of that one. Meeting notices. I think we all know that both statutes, condo and HOA, have provision regarding designated locations for meeting notices. So the board should specify meeting notices will be placed here. They will place there. It's not a moving target. It's not optional. When there is a notice, make sure those places, the designated places, if there's more than one, or place, if there is one, that it is done. And you can take a picture of it with your phone and capture it that I did post it. It's you know, time stamped so that it is memorialized and not subject to challenge. Um, committee meetings the same way, post them unless it's excluded from the posting requirement by the association bylaws. That's a condo provision. It's good practice for the HOA as well. Also, people ask this all the time. Post notice of closed board meetings. I was just on a Zoom closed board meeting. It was posted at their clubhouse, even though their clubhouse is still closed. But do post it because when in the normal times where they see the quorum of the board flowing out of the manager's office or out of the conference room or somebody's unit or coming back in their car and they say, ah, we know you're at the lawyer's office. They will ask and it will be assumed that it was something other than a valid closed meeting. But go ahead and post it and that way you've got nothing to hide. By the way, this is number nine on the list. I've got a few more to go after if we still have a few minutes. Don't change the meeting notice locations without a board meeting. You know, if it was supposed to be posted on the bulletin board and there's no bulletin board, come up with a new location, have the board say, what used to be posted at the bulletin board will now be at the mailboxes or at the entryway or some designated place. Make sure that the uh, annual meeting notice complies with your bylaws and statutes and that it's posted in the correct place. Moving to, this is number 10, election meetings. This is condo biased, so we have the condo section by placing the ballots by unit numerical order before the meeting. In other words, we don't want you just bring the, the shoe box or the regular box full of ballots and envelopes and say, well, there they are. And people have to, you know, organize them. And uh, it's not easy for them to do because to figure out if they're going to do it numerically or alphabetically. Same thing, put your sign-in sheets in the same order, so it may be unit order or the owner last name for the meeting. You can check in the ballots yourself and internally check it in and say, 
we received a ballot from Mr. Smith, checked it off, and then they can double check it. Voting certificates, it says in numerical order. If you're using voter certificates, obviously that's the way to do it. I don't like voting certificates. I told you I'd be critical of something here. Um, I try to remove voting certificates from bylaws. It usually is used against the owner. I show up, my spouse or partner is the designated voter on the voting certificate. You're gonna stop me from voting even though I showed up for the meeting. If we're using voter certificates, that's kind of the result. We try to avoid that. But if you have them, yes, keep them in numerical order. Do not open the outer envelopes without commencement of the annual meeting. Once that first outer envelope is opened, I can't take any more ballots. I have seen that happen by accident. You know, somebody in the management office or association office, wherever they were sent, opens an outer envelope thinking there might be something good in there other than a ballot, and now they've messed up our sequencing. Do not disqualify election ballots without consulting an attorney. I saw a horrible election that's being challenged. Pinellas County attorney who does this for a living, and that attorney um, agreed with the committee that the ballots which were fraudulently induced, people made uh, false campaign promises. You know, they said that they would do this, they can't do that, therefore, people who voted for them, that must be fraud. And they started disqualifying ballots. Um, I can tell you that the run of arbitration cases on that issue says if lying to the voters was illegal, we wouldn't have any national elections. That's pretty much a quote from the arbitrators in Florida. That's how they deal with that. Um, just a few comments. Since I can't see a screen anymore as far as your questions go, I think I'm relying on whoever, Carrie, who's got them. Uh, on reserves, let me make a few comments. That's probably the other don'ts from what I've seen in the last probably six months. Reserves seem to be abused again. People borrowing from reserves. We had a little bit of a dip in uh, collections because of COVID or maybe some other issues. So we borrowed it from reserves that is not there for a loan. Don't do that. Using reserves for uh, routine maintenance, not unless the money was designated for that purpose. Uh, failing to identify the reserves. Don't just say it's a roofing reserve. Tell us, does it include the soffit, the fascia, the lead boots, the decking? maybe even roof patches. If it just says roofing, that does not mean all things roofing if you didn't use it in the calculations. And I think that's it. If somebody could tell me if we've got questions, I'll take questions. We're at 52 minutes into this. Looks like 1246. Yes, we do have questions. Perfect. Okay, the determination of a fine. If the fine is on a payday basis of non Compliance. Is the paid day of non-compliance beyond a specified date following the board committee finding vote, or is it based on the time and days of non-compliance prior to the board vote or committee hearing? Great question. Fines are looking to the past. So when the board levies the fine, again, we're on August 18th, if the fine is levied on August 18th, I need to cite the dates for which I'm fining that particular individual. Historically, I can't say, your roof is dirty today, August 18th, we have pictures of it, and we may even have a, whatever, we, we know the violation is occurring today. I can't say, if you don't fix it, you're going to be fined in the future, because we're going to get into an issue of notice and date of compliance and proof and satisfactory compliance. They say, well, I had the power washer come in. Well, they didn't do a great job. Is it clean? Well, the power washer said it was. We're going to find for past behavior. We can reward them for compliance later on. When it goes to that committee, they're ratifying or rejecting the action of the board. They have really no real discretion. Since we're kind of a small group today, I can tell you, I can change that. I'm here to help. When the committee meets, if the committee wants to reduce the fine, somebody has a $1,000 fine, dirty roof, 
and that's 10 straight days. They've identified it. That was July uh, 20th to the 30th. We have pictures every day. The roof was dirty. And the committee says, that's pretty harsh. You know, let's go ahead and reduce the fine. How do they do that? We approve five days and reject five days. We've just cut that fine in half and there's nothing the board can do about it. That's just a little trick. But the statute says it is then due within five days after that meeting. So that fine becomes due very quickly once it's approved by the committee. Any other questions? Okay. Well, this is kind of going towards that. If the declaration has fine guidelines that are dated in the 90s, can we bypass them and process fines according to the statutes or are we bound by the decks since they do have fine guidelines? The answer is both. For the process and procedure, you've got to at least comply with the statute process, so board and committee. But if you have other things in your bylaws, such as the antiquated fines, say they were $50 back then, you've got a cap on your fines of $50. You're stuck with it. And that's a really good question because that's a substantive issue and your bylaws will control over the statute. You do not have the right to find that $100 a day maximum in the statute if your bylaws say $50. Great question. Okay, and then to the owner comments at board meetings, can this be limited to speaking only to agenda items? Absolutely, yes. And if you're on the condo side, it's a much clearer provision that was the intent of the comparable provision in the HOA Act that when an owner has a right to speak, it is as to agenda items. But yes, you should then state it, particularly for your HOA side. And for the condo side, uh, it's clear in the statute, you can put it in there, but also this becomes an issue as to when the owners will comment some people put it up front and they're sometimes commenting on the obvious. In other words, before we start the board business, we'll hear from the owners. Some people put it at the end. Well, after we've now voted to fire the attorney, now we're going to hear from the uh, owners who really like the attorney and maybe have some good points about him or her. So I like to put them where the chair finds them most valuable. If they're going to be, um, helpful to the board then before the board discusses the issue. If the board really has uh, this issue well in hand, let the board make their comments and then go to the floor and go, anybody now want to speak now that you've heard what the board has to say and allow the members to perhaps disagree with the board, but before they vote. Um, one, one manager commented, with our association, the board rules for meetings does not allow members to share their time. Are you saying that they cannot limit this or are you saying that they should limit this? I don't like them sharing time because it, um, it can get out of hand. Perhaps you can put it in. Yeah, we have thunder and lightning going on here as well. Oh, do you? Okay. Uh, okay, there was one more question about, she wanted you to talk a little bit about virtual meetings, and she did also ask about elections. I will say, um, we are going to have, actually, Steve is going to present an, a whole course on elections on um, September the 11th, right. and that is set up on our website, so you can go ahead and register for that if you'd like. But Steve, would you like to touch on the whole uh, virtual meeting thing? Yeah. Since we love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's obviously become the go-to method of conducting association business. Uh, in Within the firm, within Becker, we yesterday had a, a running dialogue with the attorneys from around the state because one of our older attorneys, uh, you know, very much set in his ways, very brilliant guy was dead set against them actually constituting meetings and saying you had to have a location for the meeting. 
And he cited the provision in the Condominium Act where the ballots are to be brought to the location of the meeting. I, on the other hand, am really an advocate of these Zoom meetings and indicated I can tell them where to bring those ballots. It can be to one location, and typically it's going to be the manager's office, you know, whether it's on site or off. And that's where we're going to count the ballots. I did one, gosh, seems like two months ago, and we counted every ballot out loud at the manager's office. And I liked the idea of checking in the ballots. I have a ballot here from Steve Mezer, and everybody knows he never votes at the elections. Somebody could say, excuse me, excuse me, did anybody verify that? Because we know Steve never votes in the elections. Would you put that one aside? Somebody can call Steve and say, did you vote? No. Okay, that might be a forgery. So calling it out, and again, if people are watching and they go, here I am, I'm watching, Steve's watching, and I hear, I didn't vote, that's a fraud. It's really helpful. And the same with the count. And they can look over our shoulder electronically as we look at it and they're calling it out, you know, one for Smith, one for Jones and so forth. And so they can see the actual count as it takes place. You can record it. Um, there are ways to vote and whether you do the raise, you know, the show your hand or people can do it in the chat side or you can have proxies. Uh, meetings tend to go quite well. You have to pretty much mute everyone else, which is really a benefit of doing it. So that nobody's going to interrupt the chair or speak out of turn. And the meetings tend to be a lot more cordial and a lot more efficient as they um, go through the agenda. I did have one with several hundred people on and it went flawlessly. The chair and somebody else was running the technology for him and they got through it. So I really highly endorse using a Zoom format or a comparable format for your meetings. The, the perks of that managers is you can't see the unit owners rolling their eyes, right? <laughs> that was you, a joke, you, okay. You sometimes get to see more than you wanna see of the unit owners too. Yeah, well, this is true. Uh, we actually have several more questions. Um, is there an accepted industry multi-step process for violations first, second, third, finding letters, et cetera, and a time frame for each. That's just it. I don't want you to do that. I would say that it's got to be appropriate for the violation. If it's you know leaving the trash cans out when they shouldn't be, that can be fixed literally on receipt of the letter, but I can't tell somebody to replace their roof upon receipt of the letter or get rid of their fourth dog when there's a three dog limit. So it's got to be in proportion to the violation, you know, the time for compliance, as well as the severity and the impact. Should I tell somebody at the beginning of July that the lawn needs to be cut because it's now eight inches tall and give them two more weeks and then two more weeks and then two more weeks, what's it going to look like by August if I keep sending them letter after letter after letter it just gets out of hand. So we wanna look at the impact for life safety, property values, and the ability to uh, remedy that particular violation. The key is what we would call reasonableness. We've seen things like reasonable attorney's fees. It's the same for your process. So if you have the procedure written down, always give yourself a way out that the board or CAM can deviate from this where it may impact safety, it may impact property values, or in their sole discretion, and let them go ahead and challenge you for an abuse of discretion saying, yeah, you should have done you know, three more letters to tell somebody not to carry their gun around the common elements. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. We want to make sure that they get notice and an opportunity to cure but at the same time, not subject the rest of the owners to something that will impact property values or life safety. If it's something cosmetic, the dirty driveway, sure, give them a second letter and a third letter because we really don't want somebody to uh, end up in court or a mediation and all those things over a dirty driveway. We want it fixed. Okay, so this might be, you probably already kind of touched on this a little bit, but I'm gonna read the whole question anyway. On the flip side of the violation step process, is there a minimum step process with timeframes before fining? 
finding initially must be voted on at a called board meeting, correct? Then it goes to the finding committee hearing for disposi disposition? Yes. Um, the answer to that question is yes. The idea of the fine, again, if it's something that is really, really serious, um, there, I drove down the street through a subdivision, um, happened to be in East Lake Woodlands, and somebody was parked in the middle of the street. You could not have parked more dead center in the middle of the street if you tried. Now, there's no way a fire truck or an ambulance was going to get past that car. Um, they deserved a fine for that immediately. I wish they could have handed him or her the fine that night, but sending it the next day, saying, here's a photograph of your car parked in the middle of the road. We're issuing you a $100 fine for that. Um, okay, that may come from the CAM. It's going to be considered at the board meeting. You could call a an emergency meeting of the board 48 hours notice. I wouldn't do less than 48 hours notice for that one issue. We're going to levy a fine for the car parked in the middle of the road, 100 bucks. Now, if it's something that we're a little more um, open to some time sequencing here, we could literally have the board meeting and the fine committee meeting at the same time. Now, that would say, our next board meeting will be September 11th. We've got more than 14 days notice. The fine committee meeting will be simultaneously or upon adjournment of the board meeting, however you wanna do it. The fine committee sees and hears everything. They hear what the owner says, they hear what the board said. The board says, we're gonna fine $1,000 for these dates back in August. Here's what happened, here's the event. Now I've, expedited the whole proceeding into one particular session and it's now due five days after that and that's another kind of a creative alternative to stretching the process out if i already have a board meeting set for again my september 11th hypothetical date i can add that fine and i can have the committee meeting right at that same time or immediately upon adjourning it and it'll become due five days later Okay, uh, does the proxy holder slash secretary have to physically sign in at an annual meeting on the sign-in sheet for each proxy return? Yes, please. If in fact you have a sign-in sheet or any other kind of log, if you can move that to um, the minutes and the minutes will say 38 people in person, 42 people by proxy, and so you've basically authenticated them for the minutes. I'm okay with that because we're gonna keep those proxies for a year. So we could do that. I prefer you document it so that I can look at it and say, I didn't give somebody my proxy. And I look at that and go, I wasn't there. I physically wasn't there. I certainly wasn't there. And I wanna see the proxy. And that way I'll know to look for it, say, well, there is no proxy from Steve for that meeting. So yeah, it's really a good practice, not legally required because the whole sign-in sheet isn't. It's just a documentation for the minutes as far as who was there. When we say 48 people were present, well, what 48 people? If I can show them the sign-in sheet, these are the people who were there, perfectly fine. If in fact the um the count doesn't add up then we have another issue and say wait a minute now i need to document all 48 people so it's really really a helpful thing if it is not signed in if i've got physically got those proxies but the secretary did not sign in to the attendance roster that's okay it's still going to be legal it's just going to be harder to deal with later on if challenged okay and we did have another question about um the voting electronically which just to tell you guys again on september 11th steve's going to have a one hour um ce class dedicated solely to voting electronically um so we're gonna not we're gonna skip that for today um let me see if i can i'm gonna unmute you guys on my side and then okay. what i've just done so if, if anybody would like to talk um i, I think i've unmuted everybody
if if anybody has any more questions that maybe would be easier to uh, yeah, ask rather than type out. Don't be shy, guys. Oh shoot! I just unmuted a. Okay, last call. I think that was the last of the questions on the Q&A section. So um, did you have anything you wanted to end with, Steve? I do not. I, Carolyn, do you have anything? I know that because uh, you were separated on that, if you had anything to add. You can take off mute. I guess not. I think she's trying to get her. There I am. Okay. There you are. Sorry about that. Um, no, I didn't have anything to add. I appreciate you um, letting me sit in on, on the presentation. And um, I think all the questions were very valid questions. And I look forward to um, the uh, presentations and where you can dig a little deeper in some of those issues. Yep. Um, you, are you guys going to send us a copy of your PowerPoint that I can email out to all the attendees? Are you okay with that? Do that right away. All righty then. Uh, well, we want to thank everybody for coming. I do not log off yet. I'm sending you the poll right now. I'm launching it. This is a course evaluation poll that the state of Florida does ask for us all to uh, give out at each course. So we ask that you take a minute before you log out to please complete that. And while we're in the process of doing that, let's give you a more. Um, uh, Rhonda Blankman says, nice to see your smiling face, Steve. Hi, Rhonda. Uh, thank you. Judy Hoover says, thank you, well done. Thanks. And uh, I think we got one other thank you from Gail. So uh, you guys are very welcome. And yes, thank you. Uh, great, great PowerPoint today. Great um, lecture. And I'm going to end this out with our little commercial that I created. And mm -hmm. uh, if you guys have any questions, you can always email me at BMI Tampa or I'm sorry, Tampa BMI at gmail.com. Again, that's Tampa BMI at gmail.com. I'm the one that sent you the link to the course. Excellent. So uh, where's my video? Where's my video? You guys have a great week. As we all adapt to a COVID-19 world, BMI Tampa would like to thank our chapter sponsors for their ongoing support of manager education. <laughs>